let's get back to hard evidence. Let's get back to the coins, the inscriptions. Let's get back to, for example, uh, this coin from, he was minted between uh, 644 and 656. Uh, so according to the standard Islamic narrative, this should be a coin minted by Hutman Ibn Affan. And it is a copy, a crude copy of uh, Byzantine files. And we also see the, the M and the, the, the Christian uh, crosses, which tells us that Uthman, or at the time, at, at, uh, at the time during the time of Uthman, the Arab leader who, min who minted the, this coin, <coughs> was still using a Byzantine Empire pattern with the Byzantine Empire figure on his coin and with Christian symbols. So it's the same as um, the previous coin. It's the same also with this coin, another coin minted between 644 and 656, which is also a copy of a Byzantine false. And we still have the, um, the crosses. We still have the emperor, the Byzantine emperor figure. This is him here. How, how, would, how could a, um, a Muslim in his right mind put um, a Christian sovereign on his own, own coins? This is not a Muslim coin. This is a Christian coin or um, quasi or, or pseudo Christian coin. And, uh, and still the same Byzantine Empire pattern, Byzantine Empire figure and Christian symbols. But then let's, let's go to the, to the East. Let's go to the former Sassanid Empire. This is um, a pattern, of, uh, this is um, a drachma from the, the beginning of the seventh century. Uh, this is exactly this coin here from my very own uh, collection. So this is why the, um, the picture of the photo is not very, very good. Uh, you see nowadays there are tens of websites uh, on which you can buy coins. So um, I've bought some, the, 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 the cheapest one, <laughs> because some coins are, are really, really, uh, really expensive. This one is a coin uh, which was minted by the Emperor uh, Khosrow the Thugon. This one, a, a silver coin. Um, at the end of the 5th century, beginning of the 7th century. And we see... Um, um, a very classical Sassanid Empire pattern that we will see thereafter with the, um, a lot of Zoroastrian symbolism, symbolics. We can see here, for example, the star and the crescent. The star and the crescent are, in, I think, um, symbols of the, um, the, the fire cult. You see, in the Zoroastrian uh, religion, they believe in a one God who is in um, a sort of uh, encased uh, within the fire. Um, and here on the reverse of the coin, here you see this in, inside this, uh, the green circle, there is an altar here with fire burning on top. And we, we have two attendants, uh, attendants uh, they might have been priests, Zoroastrian priest. So this is just to show you um, the general pattern of um, a Sassanid Empire drachma coin, silver coin. There were also um, copper coins. Uh, you can find it uh, on those uh, websites I told you about. But mostly we, we will deal here with, um, with uh, silver drachmas. Let me just say, look at this one. go back, go back, back to that again, just so people don't get confused. This has been brought up before the, where he is emphasizing the crescent and the star. This is not a Muslim symbol. I've had Muslims who have written me say that it's proved that this is a Muslim coin. That is assassinated. That is a political symbol. The first that we see it is first introduced in the fourth century AD. Uh, it, the first time that we see Muslims even incorporating that symbol is not till the 1800s. And it's not till the 1900s, which is the last century, that it was actually used on a flag. So Muslims need to be careful. That has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, the Ottomans were the one that introduced that uh, in, in the 1800s. It was a Sassanid political symbol 
all, all the way back to the fourth century, from what we know, even as early as the second century AD. But the one that we have today is from the fourth century. So this is nothing mm. to do with Islam, just so that confusion is, uh, that confusion is subsided. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, yes, you're, you're right, Jay. But um, you see, stubborn Muslim would tell you that um, we will see um, thereafter that this, this, those very Zoroastrian symbols were used on so-called Islamic coins. So it must have been Islamic, <laughs> but it doesn't work this way. So l- let's see this other coin. So uh, obviously this coin has been minted according to the, the same uh, um, Sassanid pattern that we just saw. This is exactly the same pattern. Um, it was minted by an Arab governor in Persia uh, between 641 and 661. So should the um, standard Islamic narrative be true or realistic, this guy, this Arab ruler, um, could have been affiliated to Usman. Whether Usman is a real figure or not, or an historical one, this is um, another, another issue. Um, we see the exact same Zoroastrian symbolism, and it's much more clear here. We can see here, for example, the fire altar, altar with the fire burning, the two priests or the two uh, attendants to the, to the fire, and also the crescent, the crescents and the, the stars, and the figure of the empire, the emperor. It is the same, it is a copy of the, the figure of Kosroes, the Kosro the Thagund. But here uh, we have some Pahlavi Persian inscription telling us that he is Yazgard the Third. This is supposed to be an Islamic coin, according to the standard Islamic narrative, because it has been minted in um, a supposedly um, Islam ruled region in Persia. But uh, it is exactly the same as with the Byzantine, uh, the Levan coins. We have here um, symbolics that are anti-Islamic. Un- that you, you cannot have um, a Muslim ruler putting some, some, it's not a pagan worship, but uh, putting some Zoroastrian symbolism on his coins. This, this cannot be. There is um, a flagrant contradiction here. This coin cannot be an Islamic coin, but it has been minted by an Arab governor in Persia, which of which we can find the name in the Islamic tradition also. And he, he, he was supposed to be a Muslim according to the standard Islamic narrative. So here we have hard evidence that Islam did not exist in the 7th century in Persia, as the standard Islamic narrative tells us. Okay, Odin, what about the Bismillah? Because that looks like that's an, uh, that looks like Islamic to me. Bismillah. Jay, Jay. Uh, j- 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 um, we'll get to it uh, in a minute, but not now. What I want, just wanted to point, uh, to point here is the Persian Empire pattern, the Persian Empire figure, and the Zoroastrian symbols. Uh, we will get to the Bismillah in a minute. Because here I want to introduce the Bismillah. <laughs> I want to introduce that we find on the coins that the Arab rulers, the Arab leaders, make new claims to justify their power. We saw that they used in the 11th the very same coin, the copies of the, 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 the coins of the Byzantine Empire. But you will see that there are, as we scroll, uh, as we walk along history as we look at um, the coins um, succeeding uh, each other, that they add something new. And uh, this novelty is new claims, new claims to justify the power. And especially here on this coin, what, what do we see? We see the Bismillah. Bismillah, Bismillah means in the name of God which means here that the ruler, even though he's, he has a, I don't know, a sort of soft touch or for Zoroastrian, the Zoroastrian religion, 
um, he still he still believes in the one God because Allah in Arabic uh, is the name of the one God. So we have a monotheist ruler putting some Arabic uh, writings on a Persian coin, which contradicts what the Persian coin uh, is telling us. This is very strange. This is very strange. And it is one of the first coins to bear, to bear this um, Arabic phrase in the name of God, in the name of Allah. And we will see around the same time that the uh, very same thing is happening also in the West, in the Levant. For example, with this coin, which is a Numayat false, can which has been minted. To, can you go back to that one? And I just want to and, 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 uh, go back to that real quickly. And then I want you to unshare because I want to talk about something here that will help people. All right. Uh, un, uh, hold on. Let me just put this because people will bring this up. And Muslims have said this in the comments when I have brought this up. Allah mm -hmm. is uniquely the Quranic God. Therefore, he's the God of Islam, which today does make sense. I would suggest that today in the 21st century, if you use the name, okay, let me finish. If you use the name Allah today, almost anybody would say that's the Islamic God. But in the 7th century, that makes no sense. And this is why you need to be careful that you don't impose Today, what we now consider to be the name of God in Arabic, which would be the Quranic name, don't impose it back onto the 7th century. Because it's not true, Odun, that everybody used, in Arabic, in Arabic, every religion used the name Allah. So the Christians would have used the name Allah, the Zoroastrians would have used the name Allah, possibly the Jews would have named, used the name Allah for their God in Arabic. Am I correct? Yes, you are. Uh, Allah only means the one God. It doesn't mean the one God of Islam. It doesn't mean Islam at all. And uh, still today, we have uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of Arab Christians in Jordania, mostly, that uh, still use the um, uh, Allah word to, to, to say God. It and Allah. they were Christianized before Islam. So the name for God before Islam even used it was Allah in Arabic, mm -hmm. in Arabic, in Arabic. So just mm -hmm. so I just want to shut this down because I know this is going to come up and people say, ah, that is an Islamic coin because it has the name Allah. Okay. Just, I just wanted to make that aside. So people well, as you pointed out, it could be a Jewish coin. The, the name for the one God in, in, in Hebrew could be Elohim, yeah. which is the very same as Allah, Elohim, Allah. Yeah. It means uh, the one God, except except in Hebrew, it's a plural, Elohim, Elohim which is, is also a, more, yeah. But in Arabic, it's the God. If you want to just uh, take it semantically, it's the God, generic. The God, the God, not God, the God, yeah, the God. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Okay, so this is what happens happens in the East. So, um, and, and Arab rulers, Arab rulers, because there were many, many other coins uh, minted uh, on this pattern with the, the Bismillah from other Arab governors. It's, it's not only this coin. Uh, you can find tens of different coins like this with different Arab governors, different Arab uh, governors in Persia uh, having minted the Bismillah on their coins. So this happened in the East and in the West, in the Levant, we find uh, something similar, for example, on this Umayyad false, which has been minted between 661 and 684. So here we can say for sure that it had been minted under Muawiyah. But we cannot say for sure that Umayyah, um, um, Muawiyah was um, a caliph and a caliph of Islam. Because what we know, what we get from the evidence of this time, is that this title, Caliph, is nowhere to be found for Muawiyah and also for Umar and, uh, and the others before him. And uh, we see also that um, the historian from this time, the, um, the one who wrote about Muawiyah, um, described him as a sort of a Christian king. He went to pray, for example, in the Holy Sepulchre, and we will see that he still use, uses um, 
uh, Byzantine pattern uh, coins. He still uses uh, crosses uh, and, uh, and so uh, Christian crosses on, on this coin. But here we see that he added the Bismillah in the name of God. So those coins are not the exact same copies of the Byzantine coins. There is something new. There is the Bismillah. There is also here Arabic inscriptions telling us about the, the, um, the validity of the coin. So we see here that um, an Arab power is kind of emerging, but it is not an Islamic power yet because of the crosses and because of the Byzantine Empire pattern, which means that Muawiyah, even though he often opposed to the Byzantine uh, emperors, he was still within the Byzantine Empire influence sphere. He was still a Byzantine himself, a kind of a Byzantine. And so when we put this uh, on the chart, what do we get? We get maybe Uthman should he have existed, who said that uh, he was reigning in the name of God. And we see that the, um, the leaders who, who followed him, who ruled after him, kept on using the Bismillah, kept on using the in the name of God, which meant that they, <laughs> they, <laughs> they pretended to rule in the name of God, which is something in the construction, which means something in the, the building of the, um, of the religion. Let's get here to uh, uh, an inscription, not a coin. A very interest, interesting uh, inscription, which is dated from 663 and mentions here Muawiyah. Muawiyah, the text is introduced by a Christian cross here, which is um, something to, <clears throat> to consider. And uh, Muawiyah, is being described as Abdallah in Greek and Amir al Muminin, so Amir al Muminin, which means he is both servant of God and commander of the believers. The Muminin, Muminin can be translated as the believers or can be also translated as um, um, the faithful. The, the one who, who have given face to something. But when you are commander of the believers, it can mean also that you are um, that the believers are the, the one who have given face to you. So the believers might be the, the, the sort of Praetorian guard or the, 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 the one who are closer to the commander. But let's keep in mind this, Muawiyah is, um, is named servant of God and commander of the believers. But uh, what, would we, what do we see here? We see a Greek inscription. This is not an Arabic inscription. We see this is a Greek inscription with a Christian cross, which means that the um, Muawiyah's administration Muawiyah's power was not an Arabic power, was not completely Arabic. It was uh, mostly uh, what we told about the, um, the decolonization and um, the countries that, that um, became independent from the, the, the colonial powers, but who, whose administration was left in place and um, who kept on using the, the colonial ways. Here we see that the, the territory um, Muawiyah was ruling over was not an Islamic one. It was still being administered uh, according to the um, imperial fashions, imperial ways with uh, Greek speaking um, uh, employees uh, speaking in Greek, uh, writing in Greek, such as here. And so uh, this was not Islam yet. People were not speaking Arabic. People were not Muslim. 
they kept on using crosses. And where we are, he might have well, well have been the servant of the one god of the Islamic god Allah, or the servant of a Christian uh, Allah. So here also something very, um, very strange and um, a sort of contradiction to the standard Islamic narrative. Muawiyah is supposed to be the fifth caliph. He, he, he should have came after the four uh, Rashidun caliphs. So Islam should, should have been implemented. Isla Islam should be in place, yet it is not. And this is hard evidence to prove it. And we have other evidence like this. Uh, we have um, in, the, um, in the East, uh, other coins. This one is um, still, still being main, minted with the Bismillah. And this one is interesting because we have the name Muawiyah, Commander of the Believers, here in the Persian script, here in the um, orange square. And we see that uh, even though Muawiyah is the commander of the believers and claims to rule in the name of God, he still uses the Persian Empire pattern for his coins with the Persian Empire figure, not his figure, but the Persian Empire's figure, uh, the Persian Emperor's figure. So uh, still, this is not Islam, even though he is commander of the believer and he rules in the name of God. Here we have another inscri inscription on, um, on, on a big stone near Taif. Um, this is an, inscri an inscription commemorating the construction of a dam. So it's in Taif near, uh, near Mecca in 678. And this is an, an inscription that um, depicts Muawiyah as being, again, the servant of God and the commander of the believers. This means something when you are both servant of God, which means the closer to God, the closest to God, and also the commander of the believers. When you put those two phrases together, it means that um, you are a sort of intermediary between God and man, which is a very um, <laughs> a grand claim, a very grand claim. We see here a sort of um, messianic pattern. Remember Muhammad as being the one who announces the coming of the Messiah, Umar as being the, um, the, 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 the savior, the, being a messianic figure. And here we, we keep on finding some messianic stuff. Uh, Muawiyah is um, claiming something that only the Messiah should be. The Messiah should be the intermediary between God and man. Here, Muawiyah is telling us, is telling, um, is telling the world for everyone to read, uh, to see this inscription, that he is an intermediary between God and man. And we see also that he, Muawiyah, um, with, this, with this coin in particular, tries to, at the end of his reign, to, to take its independence from the Byzantine Empire. This coin is very interesting. It had been minted by Muawiyah himself, um, by Muawiyah's administration, um, probably around 678. And this coin was minted um, in order to pay a tribute to the Byzantine uh, emperor. And he did so by uh, minting a de-Christianized imitation of a gold uh, coin from Byzantium. This coin, exactly. Here you see this is the uh, a coin which was minted by the emperor Heraclius um, before this one. And this is a mockery. This is a, a statement of mockery because the dechristianization um, that, that we can see on, on this cross uh, is about um, is about um, taking off the crosses from the emperor and from his sons 
and also on the rivers, putting um, instead of having um, a fully fledged cross, uh, Byzantine cross, uh, like it should um, like it should be, we have a, a bizarre. It's not a cross; it's the staff with the bar here. It's, one could, could say it's a toe cross, but no, I think it's a mockery. And um, the, the mockery goes so far as to um, imitating the, the Greek uh, inscription around, the, around the, the fake cross. Here, for example, we have Konob written here. You can see almost the same here on the Byzantine coin. Konob means uh, it means Constantinople. It means it it, it has it has been man, uh, minted in Constantinople. So um, this is uh, this is a fake, obviously, <laughs> um, and really it shows that Muawiya mocks the Byzantine emperor, mocks the Byzantine empire itself and tries to say, uh, I am my own ruler. I don't abide by your Christian views anymore. I am uh, potent enough to try to, to, to have this mockery at you. But this did not uh, went well. The emperor refused the coins. He refused that the tribute uh, would, would be paid to him with those coins. And he forced uh, Moawiya to, <laughs> to mint um, regular uh, Byzantine coins to, to pay him. So on the graph, if we, if we put Moawiya here, we see that Moawiya kept on ruling in the name of God, but he pretended to be an intermediary between God and man. And so we see here that the Arab rulers kind of added uh, new layers of um, justification to their um, powers, and they become more and more like the Messiah himself. They rule in the name of God, and there are intermediaries between God and man. So, let's see this very interesting coin. Uh, this coin, obviously, is also a Byzantine uh, coin, of our, a copy of a Byzantine coin. We see uh, um, an imitation, a very crude imitation of the Byzantine Empire pattern. But we have here the crosses, the Christian crosses. We have the M for the Numos, the false. This coin was meant, minted between 679 and 691. So uh, by an, um, an, an Arab tribe, the Ghassanids, uh, it bears the name Banu Numan, according to, I think it's uh, Clive Foss again. Uh, I should have put the, the reference here. But there is something very, very strange about this coin, that this inscription in Arabic, it's MHMD Muhammad on a Christian coin. What does it mean exactly? Who is the Muhammad? What does Muhammad mean for the people who minted this coin? What does it mean to put the Muhammad phrase, the Muhammad word, uh, on a coin with crosses and with Christian symbolism? Does it mean that the leader, the Arab uh, ruler who minted this coin, claimed to be himself a Muhammad? Usually, when we see things on a, on a coin, it relates, it points at the, um, the sovereign. For example, here, this is a copy of a um, Byzantine coin, but we have here an image of the Byzantine emperor. So who is this Muhammad? Is he the Byzantine emperor? Is he the ruler who used the um, Byzantine emperor figure to, to mint his coins? And what does it mean exactly, Muhammad? We saw that he was the coveted one, the desired one. Does this mean that there is a new Muhammad in town, a new precursor to the Messiah, someone new who claims that the Messiah will come, 
that is coming is imminent. This coin is very, very strange. And it does not fit at all the standard Islamic narrative. Such a coin is an, an heresy for, uh, in, in a, for a Muslim mind. And um, it exists. And it shows us real hard evidence that Muhammad was not what the standard Islamic narrative told us. Should he have been the prophet of Islam, a coin like this should never have existed. Yet it exists. This is not an invention. This is hard evidence from the seventh century, which tells us that the standard Islamic narrative is very wrong. So what can we make of it in our graph? Um, the Ghassanids were not rulers, uh, were, not, um, <clears throat> were only a tribe, a big tribe, but, not the, the, but they did not rule over the Levant or the, the, the East. So um, what can we make of, uh, of this? Is this a new title, title for rulers? We don't know. The only thing we can um, gather from it is that maybe, maybe um, the... Hassanid ruler claimed to be a new Muhammad himself, a new precursor, or maybe it was Jesus. Maybe it was Jesus himself that was named, who was named Muhammad, because after all, it is a Christian cross. It is a Christian uh, coin, excuse me, with Christian crosses. And so the coveted one in a Christian mind might have been Jesus himself. And this hypothesis, I think, is... Um, is relevant, but not as relevant as the hypothesis of a new precursor, a new, um, someone new who announces the coming of the Messiah. And I think the answer to this um, question lies with another coin, which appeared um, almost during the same time, which was minted by Abdallah ibn al-Zubayr. Abdallah ibn al-Zubayr was um, an Arab ruler uh, in the east, uh, in the region of uh, Bishapur, I think. So nowadays it's um, between Iran and uh, Iraq. And he minted a very strange coin. It is obviously almost uh, the, always the same um, Persian Sassanid uh, empire pattern with Zoroastrian uh, symbols, the same, very same as before. We still, we have the Bismillah. So this, this, this ruler claims to rule in the name of Allah, but we have something new here. We have the phrase Muhammad Rasul La. It's written uh, here in uh, orange and you can see it here. Muhammad, Rasulullah. What does it mean exactly? What does it mean when we find this on this type of coin, a Persian Empire pattern coin with the Persian Empire figure, with the Russian symbols? Is Muhammad here the Muhammad of Islam? I don't think so. I think we have to, to look into this phrase, Muhammad, Rasulullah, and try to understand what it could have meant at the end of the seventh century. Bear in mind that nowhere else do we find traces of uh, Muhammad as the prophet of Islam during this time. Nowhere else, on no inscription, on no other coin besides maybe the Hassanid coin that we just saw. So what does it mean? What does it mean exactly? I think we have to, to go back to the, the meaning the Hebrew and Aramaic meaning I told you about, um, which is the coveted one, according to the standard Islamic narrative, of course, when a Muslim sees such a coin, he would say this is the most Islamic coin of all because there is a shahada uh, in it, Muhammad Rasulullah. But could it be an Islamic coin with all those uh, Zoroastrian um, symbolics? and with the Persian Emperor figure, and with the Persian Empire pattern. I don't think so. I think, according so then to linguistics, 
the linguistics that we saw before, and also history, as I tell you, as I told you, uh, we have no other trace of um, Muhammad as being Rasulullah. I think here Muhammad is not a name; it is uh, a title. And uh, um, uh, uh, excuse me, not a title, a passive participle, which means not Muhammad is sent by God, but the one sent by God is Muhammad, which is he is to be desired, he is to be coveted, he is to be loved, or even worshipped. So the phrase Muhammad Rasulullah could mean may the one sent by God be worshipped, loved, coveted, desired. And when we looked at this phrase like this, um, it relates to the, um, the, biblical, um, exp the biblical messianic acclamation. In the Bible, in the Psalm 118, we have this verse, blessed is he who comes in the name of God. Blessed is he who is sent by God. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was recognized as the Messiah by the, the Jewish crowd who shouted, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who is sent by God. We have many, um, we, we have um, we have this in every gospel. And we have something more. When Jesus tells his uh, followers, his disciples in Matthew 23, for I tell you, you will not see me from now on until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is very, very close to the phrase Muhammad Rasulullah. This is very close to may the one sent by God be desired, be worshipped. And I've checked with um, Aramaic specialists, uh, I've checked with Christoph Luxemburg in particular, who told me that this was very interesting, a very interesting lead, because in Aramaic, in some Eastern dialects, this is almost the same. When you say uh, in Aramaic, uh, blessed is he we sent by God, and when you read in Arabic, Muhammad Rasulullah. So what does it mean exactly? We see that this uh, Abdallah fellow, the Abdallah Ibn al-Zubair, wrote on his coins a biblical messianic acclamation, the very acclamation which is to be shouted when Jesus will return. The very acclamation which is to be shouted in order to have Jesus come back. Jesus tell, tells in the, the gospel, you will not see me from now on until you say, Muhammad Rasulullah. So when you put such a phrase on your coins, it should, like I, I told you before, for other coins, when you put something on a coin, it relates to you. It relates to the one, to the ruler. It relates to the one who had the, the coins minted. <coughs> so what does it mean for Abdallah? Does Abdallah think that the Messiah is to come back? That people have to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? That the people have to say, Muhammad Rasulullah, in order to have Jesus come back? Or does Abdallah claim that he is himself the Messiah? Because the phrase Muhammad Rasulullah is being shouted. And I think this is the case here. I think Abdallah ibn al-Zubair claimed to be the Messiah himself, claims to be the equal, the equivalent uh, of Jesus. He is uh, an Arab leader who opposed to the Umayyads. And what did he oppose? What had he, what claim he had to power? He told his followers, I am the Messiah, I am the one who will uh, establish God's kingdom on earth. I am the new Jesus. I am like Jesus. So no need for Jesus to return. Worship me, and you will see, we, together we will establish God's kingdom on earth. 
And this is something very, very ground, <laughs> very new. And uh, let's put it on the graph like this. So here we see the successions of the succession of Arab rulers, and we see the novelty. We see the um, something brand new with Abdallah ibn al-Zubayr, uh, um, with this Muhammad Rasulullah inscription, this messianic acclamation for the one who is sent by God. We see that he, he, the ruler identifies himself with the Messiah as being the coveted one, the worship one, and as being the one sent by God. And here, when we look at the, um, the layers of claims uh, to power in the name of God, intermediary between God and men, identification with the Messiah as a Muhammad and as uh, God's envoy, God's apostle, it, it kind of looks like Islam. It's not Islam yet because we do not have the, the prophet of Islam, but we see something approaching Islam, something with an, Islam, an Islamic flavor in it. It's not Islam. Islam is yet to come, but we see how layer by layer Islam, Islam, Islam builds itself. So, what I propose, Jay, is, to, is to, to, to make a little break <laughs> uh, and to continue the presentation uh, thereafter with Abdul Malik, the Umayyads, and the Abbasid Revolution. Okay, let's go ahead and unshare. Listen, thanks, uh, Odon. This is a good way to get started. I've asked you to, to go through the coins and to unpack them for us. You have used an awful lot of your own study. You have looked also at Volker Pop's material, and you've also been coming to and to looking at it from within the seventh century, something we all need to do. And uh, this is what a huge frustration we have with so many scholars today. They still want to keep imposing the ninth and 10th century. Why don't we just look and see what's happening politically, what's happening theologically, what's happening religiously on the ground, and then interpret the coins that are from the same time period and from the same area. And you've done that. And you looked at the coins, the graph that you have there, uh, you're looking at, and you used the names from the standard Islamic narrative. That will confuse a few people because you use the name Umar and Uthman. Don't worry about it. He's doing that to show a time period. He's not saying that this is the Umar of Islam, uh, the standard Islamic narrative, or the, the Uthman of the standard Islamic narrative. But you did go through and they showed the sequence. And you're starting that by showing that in the West, over here in the West, you have all these Byzantine uh, <laughs> client states, is maybe probably the way we use it in English. These are these are subsidiaries. They're still on, they are still having to pay tribute to the Byzantine power, which is up there in the north, northwest. And so they are using the coins that the Byzantines have left behind. The mints are still there. The, 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 the mints would still be pouring out all of these coins, but they do change them. They now start adding their Arabic symbols and they start adding their Arabic reference points and they start adding their Arabic phrases. And what's fascinating is if, uh, according to the standard Islamic narrative, all of these coins should be Muslim. They should be reference after reference of Islamic, either Muhammad himself or of the Quranic reference points or of the city of Mecca or the people called Muslims. Nothing about that can you find on any of these coins until you get to later on in the seventh century. And you start out by showing that the coins in the West all have crosses on them. So they're using the same, the same, uh, reference point that the Byzantines would have, the ones in the East would have the Zoroastrian symbols in them. This, you have the, uh, the fire altar and you have the, the moon and crescent, the crescent and star, the crescent star, which is a political symbol, a Sassanid political symbol, which can be traced all the way back to the fourth century AD. Once we get into Mu'awiyah, 
there is no reference to anybody called Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, which is rather curious since they are the caliphs. The Umar that is there is not the Umar of the standard Islamic narrative. We can't find anybody that's any caliph called Uthman, or uh, we do have references to Ali, and Ali does. We're, we're going to be talking about Ali in the late uh, later on, uh, but it's not the Ali of Medina. It's the Ali of way up north, up in Iraq, and. So you, so these are important that we that we look and see who these people are. The names are quite common, mm -hmm. and, and of course, these are people from uh, places like Al Hira, which is today Kufa. You go into you, then you really zero in on Muawiyah, and I like what you've done with Muawiyah because you show that his coins here in the West, he's very much a Christian. In fact, he goes to the Church of the Sepulchre and prays in the Church of the Sepulchre. What Muslim would do that? Even Umar, who probably was a Jew, did refuse to do that when Sophronius wanted him to pray at the Church of the Sepulchre. No, he marched right up to to the uh, to where the today mm -hmm. is the Dome of the Rock, the Mount, the the the, the which is on the the Holy of Holies, uh, which Mount Moriah is well known where the Dome of the Rock sits today. And he built the first structure. You talk about the other structures. One was built later on by Muawiyah. So you have these coins showing that here in the West, Mu'awiyah was a Christian. In the East, he is very clear that he continues to mint Zoroastrian coins. And then he starts adding Arabic titles. Bismillah is the first one. And that's fascinating because in the name of God. And that makes sense. But he's not a caliph. He's well known as a king. And that's very clear. It's also you then go and you talk about the Gadara, which is the inscription there in Hamad and Gadar uh, in Syria. And that Gadara, um, written by uh, inscription by Mu'awiyah, starts with a cross, which is Christian, and then is all written in Greek. And you're saying that this is, proves that this is still used, the language of the Byzantines. The, it's not at all, in this case, he's not even using Arabic at this time. You then zero it down to 678, and you go look at the inscription at the dam in Taif. Now, for those who don't know where that Taif is, Taif is just southeast of what is today Mecca. So it is in the Hijaz. And listen, Taif mm -hmm. is well known. That would have been there for centuries. That was one of the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, oasis along the western, what they call the western plateau trading route that starts in Aden and goes to Sana, goes to Nazaran, goes to Taif, goes to Yathrib, to Khaybar, Tabuk, and then on up to Gaza in the north. But Mecca was never on that trading route. I think we've shut, shut that one down. So it makes sense that he would put it, he'd build a dam there because by this time he controlled all that land. But what's interesting is what you what that inscription says. Mu'uya, the commander of believers and the servant of God which is a messianic reference point. And you've mentioned this, that many of these leaders took on this messianic role. They were almost putting on that mantle for themselves. Are you suggesting that this is what we is doing here uh, in this dam inscription? Exactly, exactly. When you claim to be the intermediary between God and man, which, which is what the, the combination of servant of God and commander of the believers means, when you claim to be such a, an extraordinary uh, ruler, you, you're, um, you're not the Messiah, but uh, you try to be. Okay. And because the mm. Messiah had not returned, they were now taking on, in some ways, they were now taking on that function themselves, which would aggrandize them in the, in the eyes of their own people if they did. So you can see why that gives them more mm -hmm. authority. I liked what you did by zeroing in on the Muhammad, what we call the Muhammad coin, the Ghassanid coin from 679 to 691. This is at the end of Mu'awiyah's reign. This is a coin that has the word Muhammad written on it. It's written, it's a Ghassanid, so it's over in the east. And, uh, well, no, the Ghassanids are in the west. They're actually the ones that were... No, in the west, they in were Lachmid. in the west. The Lahmid were, were in the east in Mesopotamia. The Ghassanids were the traditional luxuries of, um, of the Byzantine Empire yeah. at the frontier between uh, Persia and the Byzantine Empire. Okay, so they're over here in the West. And what's interesting, this word Mahmud here, on, but it's very much a Christian coin. It has the cross on it. So what, mm -hmm. what's Muhammad's name doing on that Christian coin? And that's the question you asked. Could this be a messianic figure? Could this also be a reference to Jesus? And what I, you then do is you then look at Zubair's coin in 685. Zubair was a governor. Now, was he a governor under Abdul Malik in 
Kufa, was he a governor in Petra? Kufa would be in the east, Petra would be in the west. I think he was a governor uh, much farther east in Bishapur. Bishapur, okay. So you're saying... Bishapur. Over And the thing with Petra... Then what is, is the very interesting. Today? It's Gibson's hypothesis. We should maybe discuss uh, about this uh, later. Some other time, But, yeah. Um, we have no hard evidence that he was in Petra. I think he might have been in Petra, but it is all um, a conclusion of a very critical analysis of the standard Islamic narrative. Okay. The standard Islamic okay. narrative tells us about um, the wars between the Zuberids, the, the partisans of uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and the Umayyads. And that it also tells us that he was supposed to be the governor of Mecca which right. contradicts the evidence that we have from his coins because his coins were minted much more farther east in uh, nowadays Iran. So what was he doing in Mecca when he was supposed to rule in Iran? Yeah, okay. So But he was opposed to the Umayyads, so uh, I think it, it, it is um, very probable that he went along Mesopotamia with his troops to oppose the Umayyads. And what do we have here? We have Petra, but this is uh, another story, another issue. We can do that later, but let's, another get time. let's get back to the coin, because it's this word Muhammad, uh, the Rasulullah, that, that, you, that you really zeroed in on, that, that, that mm -hmm. phrase. Muhammad Rasulullah, which is the second half of what we know as the Shahada, the Shahada was then introduced by Abdul Malik in, in, in 685, sorry, 692 and 691. We're going to get Let that in see. the next episode. So he has this phrase... Muhammad Rasulullah, and what you say, you need to look and see what it meant back then, not what it means today. Today, it's very clear. It means Muhammad, the, 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 the prophet of God, the, the, uh, the servant of God. And that's why today we need to be careful that we don't... The envoy, the apostle. Well, it doesn't mean prophet. It doesn't mean prophet. Rasul is not prophet. Okay. Rasul me, is okay. the one who is You're being Muslims sent. say that today. Today, Muslims would say it is prophet of God. This is what they always tell me. So I have to go. And that's why mm -hmm. most Muslims will say, see, that is Muhammad, the prophet of God. It's referring to the prophet. And that, again, is a, 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 mm -hmm. a, this is something that happens all the time. We want to take, we want to look at what we know today in Arabic, and we want to impose it back onto what was happening there. Just like we said, that discussion we had with the name Allah. We assume Allah mm -hmm. is the Quranic name for God. Therefore, when we see it on a coin, it has to be a Muslim the Muslim God and only the Muslim God. Because today, Muslims believe that it is only the Muslim God when many Christians today use that. And the same in this mm -hmm. case, Muhammad Rasulullah, today it does mean the man, Muhammad, who is the prophet of God, who was introduced by the Abbasids in the 8th century, but not in the 7th century. So we need to look and see what Muhammad meant in the 2nd century, or Muhammad Rasulullah meant in the second 7th century. And you're saying that this uh, Muhammad, this word could be the desired one a co or coveted one. This could also be the greatly beloved. But when you put it in a phrase like that, the best, the best translation would be, may the one who sent, was sent by God is to be desired or is to be blessed. May this one sent mm -hmm. by God be, is, may he be blessed. That's really the best way to translate this, which would make sense on a Christian coin, or in this case, a Zoroastrian coin that was minted by Zubair. That makes sense in the seventh century. Therefore, let's keep it in the seventh century. And then you could see that there are antecedents to this right in the biblical text. There's all kinds of antecedents in the Old Testament and in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. So this could be a messianic title. This could be, uh, could be, Either Zubair is referring, Zubair is taken on that title for himself, because as you've said many times, many of these rulers, that's how they would aggrandize himself, give authority to themselves. He could be talking about himself, or he could be talking about Jesus. We just don't know, because we're not there in the seventh century to ask him. But it looks like that we must make sure that we do translate it in the context that it means at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'd like to do, and what we've said we're going to do, is go and continue on looking at what these coins, but what I'd like to do now is to go and unpack Abdul Malik, because he is really the one that really stands out, and he is the one that we've been talking about for 
almost a year and a half or more than that even. But he is the one that I'd like to unpack. We need to set, spend more time with him, not in this episode because he would take up too much time. We've already gone way over time. So could you come back, Odon? Let's keep, let's just go, let's finish this one down. Let's see what people have to say. We've covered from the time period of, from the early seventh century up until 685. Now we want to move to 692, and we're going to come back and start unpacking what gets more exciting, because we're now going to start seeing when Islam starts to be seen on the coins. Okay, do talk about it. Do come back. Get, make Put your comments there. We'd like to see what you have to say, and we'll certainly answer them as best we can. Odom, thanks for coming on board again, for doing a Thank you. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> we're going to keep our same clothes on and just go right into the second episode. You all will see that. And until that time, this is Odon in France and Jay here in the United States. Over and out. Mm -hmm.